feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. Hey everyone, I'm your host, Mark Scribner on The Shrimp Tank today. I have an amazing guest, someone I know really well. I've actually been to a couple of his workshops across the country. His name's Jason Lanier. We'll bring him on just a minute. Uh, I would like to remind all our listeners that The Shrimp Tank is nationally syndicated through iHeart. You can get this show, all previous shows, basically anywhere that you can download your podcast, Google, Stitch, SoundCloud. Uh, iHeart is, as I mentioned, in the entrepreneurial section, Apple, wherever. Um, we are really excited today to have Jason Lanier. The tagline, Jason, so you know, is where book smarts and street smarts collide. One of the cool things about you, I mean, you are such an accomplished artist, but more so, I think, is you're an amazing entrepreneur, business owner. When you're doing things in your, your craft, you're looking at verticals. In this day and age with COVID and any small business owner, you have a unique lens, no pun intended, uh, to talk to these entrepreneurs and business owners about, you know, what they're doing right, how they could take their game to the next level, which you've been able to do at the various, various highest level. I would like to also just give you some props. I mean, Jason's done some magazine shoots. He is really very, very early on mastered the YouTube game about getting his message and his branding out there to a level that I don't think many people have ever enjoyed. So with that in mind, Jason, welcome to the show. <laughs> That's a very, very warm welcome. Thank you so much. It's, it's, it's an honor to be here and it's a pleasure to work with you. Great. You know, so if you look at, you know, an operating system or computer, right, you know, people talk about like iOS, Apple, whatever, you know, it's an operating system that makes, makes uh, the technology go, go around. But could you maybe tell us a little bit about um, your company, what you do? And then I'd like to dig real deeply into some of the common traits and commonalities you think really requires uh, someone to, they might not want to get to your level per se, but you are at the top of the food chain in your craft. And I know that you get to talk to a lot of uh, thousands and thousands of people across the world about what they're doing and how they're doing it. So it, maybe we take a quick step back, say, who is Jason Lanier and, and how did you get your foothold into this industry? Uh, great, great question. And thank you again for being here. Um, I started off my career as a as an adult. I started adulting as a hotel executive. Um, I didn't start as a hotel executive, but I worked my way up. Um, I did that for over a decade and then transitioned into photography. I took a lot of the work ethic, the traits, the branding, the marketing, everything that I learned in hotels, I took that, I added a lot of tenacity and sleepless nights to becoming a photographer. So I left a really lucrative job as a hotel executive, which would have kind of just set me up for the rest of my life to kind of have a, a nice life because I wanted to pursue my dream. And so I left that. Uh, I did hotels and photography simultaneously for six months, which was grueling. Yeah. Um, it was grueling to do that. And so um, I uh, would work Monday through Friday. My job was Starwood. And then I would <laughs> fly out to somewhere to go shoot a wedding. I didn't even want to be a wedding photographer. I got into it because Somebody volunteered me to shoot a wedding and I ended up liking it. And that was that big transition from film to digital about 13 years ago. And it was, it was when wedding photography was taking on much more of an artistic approach from the boring, you know, formulaic stuff that we normally see. And so I started shooting, I started moonlighting on the weekends as a wedding photographer, but I decided if I was going to do it, and I, I think this goes to where you're talking about a strategy. I, from the beginning, I had a strategy and my strategy was simple. I don't want to be a, a shoot 40 weddings, 30 weddings, just in Southern California where I live. That to me is boring. I wanted to be bigger. I wanted to be a brand. Everything was about building a brand. And so the way I was going to build my brand was by making myself, <laughs> just truly making myself what I wanted to be. And I wanted to be a destination photographer because part of it to me was, not just about shooting, it's about, I want to travel. I want to use this job to fulfill some life goals of mine. And so I started shooting weddings all over the country. And because I had another job, um, a good job, I didn't really care about how much money it, it would bring in. Some of the weddings were $1,500, some were 2000. And my, my rule was simple, pretty dress, pretty bride, pretty venue. <laughs> and that formula, got me into so many great venues and so many great opportunities 
that it really drove a lot of my success. And people are like, where's this guy coming from? He's gone from nobody has any clue who he is. And now he's shooting weddings all over the place. Typically it takes somebody 10 years to start shooting weddings and branching out. And I, my whole mindset is I, I never think that something is impossible. I just think, well, if you want it bad enough, you'll find a way to do it. It's like, where did, water that, where did that come from, Jason? Is that, uh, you know, did you learn that from your parents? Where, where, where's the origin of that fear, fearlessness, I guess? <laughs> My mom said that I came into this world with two things, a smile, and I was born a boss. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so <laughs> those are her words. And so I, I, I had incredible parents, very loving parents, but I am, I am a different personality from them. I'm just built this way. I'm built to question why I'm built to, Hey, you can't do this. Why, why not? Mm -hmm. And, and, and to answer part of that, I think part of it relates back to my childhood of, of dealing with being physically disabled. I'm legally disabled. And I was told I wouldn't walk again. I was told a bunch of different things and we can get into that if you really want to, but that built this tenacity of you are not going to tell me I can't do this. You are not going to tell me that I can't be successful. You are not going to tell me that I won't walk again, that I won't do this. And so that um, fortitude to succeed and that desire to prove people wrong and to prove myself right has driven me where I'm at today. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I mean, I, I recall Larry Ellison had you know, oftentimes talks about he had, you know, a chip on his shoulder and where it came from. And in his case, it was a negative situation. It was uh, a father who was critical and whatnot, you know. Um, but Chip, chips it, are great, dude. Chips yeah, are great. No, absolutely. <laughs> now, you know what I found really interesting being an entrepreneur is um, you kind of in the early stages, the business was serving you and your lifestyle. It kind of, you really approach it from that vantage point in the beginning because you had a vision of what you wanted your life to be like and had and the, the business kind of like augmented and complemented that. But it did start, it sounds like, with, you know, just a vision of what you expected your lifestyle to be. Maybe you didn't want to be, you know, a nine to five or, you know, sitting in a, a corporate uh, office and doing that kind of work. Is that, is that kind of how it all went down is like lifestyle, lifestyle, lifestyle first? Lifestyle first. I mean, my hot, my whole passion as a teenager was photography. So it wasn't just like I chose something. I love photography and I've loved it ever since I was a kid. I watched my dad shoot with the Nikon long exposures in Carlsbad caverns. And that made me fall in love with photography. He wasn't a pro. He just was a hobbyist. But then during high school, my first job was a paper boy. I saved up for two years, bought my first Nikon. And so when I had the opportunity to say, you know, I, I, I could manage hotels. I could do this for the rest of my life, or I could truly be Indiana Jones. I could have an adventure for a life. And so that's what it was. But even though I was traveling and even though it was fun for me to travel, there was very much a plan in place. And the plan was simple, build an incredible por portfolio. And I, I've said that to countless photographers when they say to me, hey, I can't get my business going. I'm like, you have to have a product to sell. You have to have something that people want. And if you can't do that, then no matter how smart you think this is or this kind of pyramid scheme, whatever you want to build, if you don't have a product that people want, you're, you're done. And so that was part of it. Yeah, no, without a doubt. I mean, that's in the process too. But again, back to the, how many people do you actually, you know, I know COVID's changed a little bit of it, but I mean, it's thousands and thousands of people all over the world that you're- well, Hundreds of thousands. I mean- Thousands, right. Yeah, it's it's all with all my social media. It's a, it's a half million. I mean, there's there's a lot of people that that you touch and reach on a on a um, daily basis because I post quite a bit. And one thing that that's been I think critical to my success has been I've always focused on the depth of my following versus the width. And I think that that's something that a lot of folks don't really grasp. They're more concerned with how many likes and how many of this, but if you look at my followers, they are, they are really loyal. And it's because I truly connect with them. I understand what they're looking for and I try to give it to them. And, um, and not only just, hey, here's a technique on photography, it's about inspiring people to live the dream that I've been able to live. Yeah, I mean, 100%. I mean, I obviously follow you and we interact off the show and you do put a lot of, a lot of time into the relationships. And, and you know, when you have, 
half a million million views and you're you know you're looking at someone stuck on something you're actually investing and and trying to help them get a breakthrough or solve a problem which which i think really kind of demonstrates what you just said now i agree with what you said about having a portfolio and a product but you know a lot of photographers a lot of business owners they have like the perfect mousetrap and widget but they don't have the mindset so what do you think you know compared to you know, the average person who's really trying to, you know, make it or break out, um, what is the mindset or what are the, the attributes do you think that, that um, they should have or that helped you, I guess, is the most important thing? Well, I know this is going to sound really cliche, but I, I mean, I've never known an entrepreneur that was not really manic about his or her job. Um, it, you really have to want it. People ask me all the time, what are your hobbies? What are your, what do you do for fun? What do you do? And I said, photography. <laughs> what else do you do? Photography. <laughs> what, I mean, I, I eat, live and breathe this stuff. And the, the thing is, I truly love it. So there's, there's an insane work ethic that has to go along with it. I mean, I take time out for the kids, take time out for the things that need to be done because I've made commitments in those areas. But I'm truthfully telling you, outside of exercise, family stuff. And well, that's about it. It's, it's photography. And so it's about an, it's about an incredible work ethic. It's about thinking about your strategies, about what you really want to accomplish, asking yourself, what do I really want to do? And I'll also say it's about being flexible. I mean, we all have these plans and goals and we put these charts up, but everything changes. It's just, this year's the perfect example with COVID. I mean, we, we've had to completely adapt and change what we do as a business. We've lost all workshop revenue. We've lost all client revenue because you can't really go out and shoot, especially here in California. So I've had to change everything that I do. And I've done that to a great extent during COVID to a lot of success. So, I mean, Rotolite, the, I'm the, the main spokesperson for Rotolite. I just got off the, C, uh, the phone with the CEO this morning. He, they're over in the UK. Um, we've had the best December and November in the history of the company. Yeah, and I didn't help that. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> you yeah. did. I yeah. know you helped that. <laughs> Rod, Rod was uh, emailing me today. So I was, uh, he got me to spend another $4,000 somehow, but you know, good, <laughs> good for you. At least you got the credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the commission. But, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but no, it's, it's, you know, it, I think that's the difference is you see during, this is such a great, people are going to study this year's, this year for the rest of history. They really will, because you'll have In so many, world. sure, yeah, you have so many businesses that have gone out of business, but you also have other businesses that have thrived and it's not thriving off of the pandemic. It's figuring out how to thrive during the pandemic. And that's the difference. And so we don't have a product that, you know, oh, we can sell PPE or whatever else. We don't have a product like that. We have a product that is really discretionary. People don't have to buy it during a pandemic. So you have to figure out ways to market it and brand yourself and brand your product to where people still want to purchase it during tough economic times. So I was just curious. I mean, back, back, um, you were at the very beginning of, of, the YouTube and like kind of how that works. What, how did you stumble upon? I mean, again, I know that you talked about having verticals and then, uh, you know, more recently I was doing some, some research on some of the stuff that you've been able to do where when you do produce content, you're always thinking about like, it's not just the now, but like, where can it feed into the ecosystem of what you're trying to do? Um, was that something, I guess a couple of questions, was that something that you figured out early on in, in terms of when you're producing content? Um, and then secondly, like when did the YouTube part, was that part of like something you figured out vertically in the very beginning? Great question. Um, started off like a lot of folks on Facebook, you know, forever ago. And then um, figured out pretty soon that Facebook was at some point, you, ha you, have to, you have to realize that these companies are going to start to shrink your audience, which they do. And so I saw, look, here's a platform with YouTube that actually there's, it's a win-win. The more I'm successful on YouTube, the more ad revenue they make. And I make some ad revenue. So they're, they are motivated, they're, they're motivated to, um, or incentivized to make me help this channel be a success. And so I started really, I didn't plan on being a YouTuber at all. Truly, I tr planned on, hey, look, I can market my business this way. So what it started off was, I would go and 
um, shoot a wedding. And then I'd say, okay, if I shoot the wedding here, whenever I look up a wedding venue that I'm going to go shoot, a video pops up. So I would look at that video and I'd be, okay, this is what the venue looks like. And I'm thinking, well, this is what brides and grooms are doing. So if they're going to be doing this, then they're going to book me. So like I shot a wedding at Disneyland and, and started, people started calling me for Disney weddings. And I'm like, this is interesting. So I started actually almost like a reality thing, recording my shoots and then putting them up on YouTube. And then I had a few videos that hit and I, they went viral and that was a life changer. I went to Six Flags in New Orleans as, as an abandoned thing and I shot it. And that was my first one over a million views. And then I started posting videos and I did one in the, the desert with the Camaro speeding by, it's a wedding shoot. That one did a trillion views. And it, it started to really blow up from there. But the big moment was when I had a, I had a good following. I mean, maybe collectively at the time, 50, 100,000 followers. But um, I was switching from Nikon to Sony and people were asking, they kept asking me why. And this is the true story, but they kept asking me why I switched. And I was getting so many requests for to answer that question on Facebook. I got tired of writing out the answers. So I kid you not, I'm sitting in Idaho and I, I was at a Marriott and I pulled out a notepad and I literally wrote, okay, freaking, I, I'm, I'm not answering this anymore. And I wrote 10 reasons why I'm going to switch. And I was in the middle of a, an abandoned mine uh, and I filmed 10 reasons why I switched. And that video went galactic. Mm, and yeah. that got me noticed by Sony. And then Sony, I started working with Sony as a Sony artisan and it just went nuts from there. But it's, I think at the core of it, Mark, it's about authenticity. Yeah. Everything that I've done has been, this is what I really do. This is what I really believe in. And so I, I know I can stand behind it a year ago, five years ago, and five years from now, it's, 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 authentic, it's been authentic. So I'm curious, and again, this is something I think I stumbled on one of your videos a couple of weeks ago, but, and, and I, I have this, some friends that are some pretty famous uh, publishers and artists where the algorithms now, you know, like the Spotify's, the streaming stuff, um, the TikToks of the world, like the creatives and the people like you that actually are the product for these companies. Um, or tweaking the algorithms and um, you're not getting paid probably for a lot of the stuff that you do, but you are the content for um, a lot of these entities. Uh, do you see a business opportunity there for you at some point? I mean, it'd probably be a pretty big change, but I know you talked to some of these venues about like, you know, a new platform, but how, how is it going to be good for you? How are you going to get paid? Which I think is really important because we do need to be paid for our time, especially when you're, you are the product and you are the content. I was just curious, like, is that something you worry about being rel relative with all these changes and the YouTubes and the Facebooks and all this stuff? Yeah, definitely. Over the time, YouTube has changed significantly. A lot of their creators were making too much money, according to Google, which Google owns everything. So I don't know why there's, that's too much money. But so, yeah, YouTube's definitely changed over the last year, two years. It's changed quite a bit. But you see, like you referenced, I spoke to a, a budding, uh, you know, startup uh, uh, social media company, and that it that was my question to them. I said, "How are you guys going to make money?" I assume it's ads. Yeah. Well, what about me? Well, I mean, I mean, I'm the one actually providing the content for you to you, and I think over time, what will happen is, yes, I think social media companies will have to bend to that because artists. At first, we want all that 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 magical word. We want exposure. But then um, at some point you reach a, a point of, I, I got to get paid for this. It's nice to create, but I got to get paid. So I definitely think over the time, because yeah, TikTok, Reels, Instagram, they're all making trillions of dollars off of everyone's work. And what do we get out of it? Oh, I'm an influencer. Okay, that's great. And this is something I've said to countless people. It's great you're an influencer, but how are you converting that to money? Mm -hmm. It yeah, doesn't yeah. matter. If you have all these views and all this... Oh, I had, I have people tell me, oh, I had 5 million views on this. Okay. How'd you convert that to money that mm -hmm. I ask myself that question constantly. And if you can't answer that, then you're going to be, you're going to fizzle out. And that's just the truth. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because I, I, all I know is the music industry and that, you know, most of those artists, the, the only way that they really could monetize that would to be live venues, which I know you do in effect or did before COVID and will do again, but but they, they don't make any money on the streaming. Um, the, the big titans of the, the tech world have kind of squeezed them out. So 
yep. at some point there's going to be a crescendo, if you will, where something's got to give uh, from a technology perspective, because, you know, if artists can't go and do concerts and make their, you know, their money there, then like, how's it going to work for them? They're going to stop producing content. Yeah. And I think the other piece to that, Mark, that's really important is I've always found a way to market myself in my videos. And I think that's another thing that a lot of artists miss out on is they miss out on these opportunities to market themselves, which is such a lost opportunity. If you're going to put up a video and it's going to get a million views, make sure that you're doing things in there that are sellable. So even if you don't actually get money from TikTok or from Instagram or whatever else, you're making money elsewhere. And that's exactly what I do through workshops, through selling products, through getting commissions, through all these types of things. I'm making sure even if Instagram never pays me and I'm getting four or five, whatever thousand likes on an image, I'm going to convert that money some way. I got to get paid for that some way. And I think that's what artists need to do is think constantly be thinking about the angle to make themselves money because if you're not thinking about that angle you can't make money and if you can't make money unless you're rich you're not going to be able to continue to create your work i'd like to remind all our listeners again um you can follow us on the shrimptank.com forward slash boston so i just take your little cue about networking marketing yourself right absolutely um, you can follow but, my podcast too jasonlinder.com slash podcast yeah absolutely and then uh, i'll turn my camera over for the rota lights we'll get some more tags for you there you go. <laughs> so where do you see this going? I mean, you know, um, I know you are the product, but can you replicate like kind of this experience? I mean, you know, some of the things about business owners, whatever product it is, but, you know, eventually there might, you might be turned into an animation or something like that as you get older, you know, it's right. animation, you know, it, it won't be you actually, someone will digitally recreate you somehow. Um, and the company keeps going, but <laughs> Where do you see, like, um, you know, do you think about, like, there's only a certain amount of hours in a day or certain places you can be, but can you take your business, for, for example, and scale it? Um, I mean, you can, you can only work a certain number of hours every day, right? Correct. Uh, but how, how do you approach that aspect? Or do you even care about it? Great question. When you talk about scaling, I, um, there's, well, a number of years ago, one of the things that photographers do is that they'll use their name and then they'll brand it out. They'll franchise it. And then they'll have, you know, other photographers. So to be like Jason Leonard photographers, and then you teach them and train them. And then they go out and shoot weddings and, and do all of those things for you. Um, I did that for a little while, made great money at it. And I stopped. And the reason I stopped was simple. I found myself running a business, which I did in hotels already. That part of my life, I don't need to do again. I found myself running a business instead of being a photographer. Now I'm looking at P&Ls and I'm looking at money in, money out. I'm looking at their pictures instead of mine. I'm not out in the field creating any longer. And so could I scale this and make a lot more money? The honest answer is yes, actually pretty easily. The truth, truth of the matter is though, I got into this because I wanted a certain life for myself and that life, I want to see the world. And I want to live the world. And I see myself when people see me with the hat and everything else. I really, from the time I was a kid, I've wanted to do something like Indiana Jones with the camera. And so me being in remote forests and caves and everything else, that's what I wanted for my life. I don't want a big business. I never have. And so, um, yeah, but for, for other photographers, are there ways? Yeah, absolutely. If you establish a brand, you can absolutely franchise it out. You could have other people teach on your behalf if you teach them. Because really, the, the, the workshops that I do, I mean, yeah, I think there's something different when it's the person teaching it. But you could teach, this is the formula, this is the curriculum, this is what you teach. So yeah, you could make this something that you could roll out all over the place. And, and um I think if I were to do anything, to, truthfully, I'd hire someone else to do that and scale that out. And I would just be able to continue to work and, and create my work because at the end of the day, that's what I want for my life. So again, um, you know, one of the things that we try to do is impart knowledge here. Um, you know, we have a section that we, we usually do, it's called Hard or Not, but what aren't you good at? Like, what, if you were to like kind of go in the way back machine and say, Hey, um, I learned this. I wish that somebody taught me this at the very beginning. I mean, I think life is about experiences, but is there anything out there that, you know, that you could say, like, if you had a mentor or somebody that you would have avoided? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, 
I think one thing that's really a problem, and I'm sure it's not just the photography industry, but that's the industry I know, is that in our particular field, um, secrets are everywhere. Secrets meaning you have no clue how sponsorships work. You have no clue how all of the, I mean, we're even secretive about, I won't tell you what location I shot at. And I won't tell you, I, I was one of the first photographers truly out there that would post my settings on every picture. And it kind of blew photographers away. Why are you posting your settings? You're going to tell people how you did it. So what? Uh -huh. I mean, really, are you that worried about your work? So I think if anything, um, when I went through the whole, and it felt like a huge machine of becoming well-known, whatever word you want to use with that, but becoming very well-known. Famous. Um, yeah, um, famous, <laughs> becoming famous. Um, I wish I would have had a mentor at that point. That would have been key for me because it tells you the pitfalls and just the things that come. People have no clue what comes when you become quote unquote famous. And it's, uh, it's if you've never been through it and you got to understand, I'm just, a, I'm just a dad. I'm just a guy who likes taking pictures and all of a sudden you're thrust up on a stage and I enjoyed it, but there's a lot of sharks and, and piranhas <laughs> that come for you in that territory. And that would have been incredible to have somebody help navigate that for me. And, and that's why if, if you listen to some of the recent podcasts and stuff that I've done, um, I've actually spoken about that stuff because I'm trying to say, hey, I went through it. Nobody else in the world talks about it. So let me try to help other people. So it, if and when they go through this, they won't get chewed up and spit out. Mm -hmm. so, um, so having a mentor or just someone that, that could be a sounding board that's not conflicted out, that doesn't, like, you know, if you're going to some of these vendors that you're dealing with, they have agendas, right? Um, they want a certain thing from you, but having somebody impartial that could help you walk through some of these challenges and solve some of these problems. Yeah. And I just think in general, I mean, just understanding I'm such a guy that's huge into relationships. Like, you, you know, that Mark, you've, we've met so many times and I, I, I just love people. And so I believe in the goodness of people. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm assuming, hey, this person's in it for great reasons, this company, that company. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, this is happening. And it's like, oh, <laughs> I didn't think we had that kind of relationship. But I, I think that that's something that surprises a lot of photographers um, because, un, you know, the world of photographers becoming quote unquote famous is pretty much, it's still relatively new compared to other artistic endeavors like singers and actors for photographers to quote unquote become famous is still kind of a new thing and so we don't even have you know past history to look at of okay we need to kind of watch these pitfalls so um no i just think that you know understanding hey and and i speak to photographers about that i'm like look th that's great that they're offering this to you but what, what's your benefit yeah definitely people have agendas and it's, it's unfortunate but you have to have your head on a swivel especially you know, someone like you that you're so visible, um, you know, it, it's, it's a, definitely a challenge, I'm sure. Um, now, do you take any downtime for yourself? Or are you just like Energizer Bunny all the time? Like, how do you stay, keep your A game going? You know, the, the, as I mentioned earlier, the only downtime I'd say I really have is um, <laughs> I, I pretty much just do exercise, family time and photography. So I'm okay with that. A lot of people wouldn't, they would want more diversity, but I'm really okay with that. I really am an energizer bunny. As many people know, I've had countless people who are two decades younger than me who they wear out. They can't keep up. Yeah. They can't keep up. And every person that I have work with me, I'll always say, look, one year with, or I always tell them three months with me as like a, a normal person's one year. I'm telling you, you're going to be exhausted. And I've seen it countless times. They get, they just get so exhausted. And when we travel and I'm out shooting and no joke, like they'll be in bed, like exhausted. And I'm out shooting the Milky Way and doing this. <laughs> They're like, what are you doing? And where were you? And I'm like, I was out shooting. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it, I, if there's one thing that I've been blessed with, it's been an incredible stamina. And, uh, but I think part of that too, is you just have to want it more. As, as cliche as it sounds, it's, I mean, it hurts for me to walk every step I take hurts. And so it's, you got to want it more. Yeah. And, you know, we're about to wrap up in a minute, but I think one of the most powerful thing is if you can truly combine a business with a passion, it's a, it's a prescription for, for just great abundance. And you, you've been able to demonstrate that. 
Jason, um, for our listeners, um, what is the best way? I know all you have to do is type in Jason Lanier on any social media platform and he's front and center, but um, for people that want to learn more about your company, your craft, what you do, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? I, I really believe that the best way to go, uh, just real quick on that, I'll say I've always told photographers, if you only think about the craft and you don't think about the business, you're going to be done. And it's the and you have photographers do the opposite though. All they'll think about is making money. They won't think about the craft. It's really combining those two that makes you a success. Um, to find me, I think best place is my website. Go to jasonlanier.com. That'll link you to anything from YouTube to podcasts to any of the other things that we do. And if you want to learn from me, that's a great place to do it. Um, we have a Patreon channel if you want to learn online, patreon.com slash Jason Linear Photography. And uh, that's about it. But I am beyond grateful for your time. And, and I hope that this was edifying for people out there. And I'm uh, very humbled to be here. Thank you. So all those links will be below the video here. But we do want to wrap up with the most famous part that uh, <laughs> we always enjoy. And I, I, hopefully I get it right, because I know some of the models screw it up. But let's do, do. it together. <laughs> so what do, we, what do we say, Jason, in, in uh, your world? We only have one chance, one chance to get it right. Get it right. Thanks, Jason. All right, brother, take care. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond.